Hi, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to our book talk and conversation on the revolution according to Raimundo Mata by Gina Apostol. I am your host for today. My name is MT Villarta. My pronouns are they, them, theirs. I am currently a PhD candidate in ethnic studies at the University of California, Riverside. I'm hailing from Los Angeles, which is the original and ancestral homes of the Tongva people. Um, I'm also former staff of Eastwind Books of Berkeley, and I'm so happy to be here and to continue to support um, this amazing and radical bookstore that has fostered such critical and revolutionary social spaces for us all, even in the midst of a global pandemic. So thank you all for joining us today. I am so excited to introduce um, Gina Apostol. So Gina Apostol is the Penn Open Book Award-winning author of Gun Dealer's Daughter as well as a two-time winner of the National Book Award in the Philippines for her novels, Bibli Bibliolepsy and the Revolution, according to Raimundo Mata. Her short stories have appeared in various anthologies and journals, including the Gettysburg Review and the Penguin Anthology of Asian American Fiction, Charlie Chan is Dead, Volume 2. So before we... Um, move on with the program. I'm gonna um, share what the agenda is today. So after I'm done talking, um, we're gonna have an inter a brief introduction to Eastwind and the bookstore. Um, Gina is gonna be reading um, an excerpt from The Revolution according to Raimundo Mata. So we'll be able to hear some, um, some, some, of, some excerpts from the book itself. Um, we're going to follow up with a conversation between me and Gina where I'm, I'm going to ask her some questions. And then at the last, around like the last 10, 15 minutes of, of the um, program, we will have the opportunity to ask questions as well. But please feel free to um, post questions on the chat box. We'll be monitoring the chat if there's, you know, um, a question or a comment that really like vibe with you feel free to give the thumbs up and react and just you know have a conversation in the chat itself so um, without further ado i'm going to turn it to um kat and she's going to give us a few words about east wind Hi everyone, this is Kat. My pronouns are she, her, hers, coming here from uh, Oakland, Ohlone land. And East Wind is your go-to Bay Area place for Asian American literature and ethnic studies. So we really, really appreciate you all for coming here today on spending your Saturday. And we are so excited to have an award-winning author, Gina Apostle, to talk more in depth about her book, The Revolution According to Raimundo Massa. So please enjoy, sit back, relax, and also decompress in this talk and feel free to, as MT has mentioned, to share your comments, any questions, and we will bring them up later in the Q&A at the end. Have fun. Awesome. So without further ado, presenting Gina Apostol with um, reading of The Revolution According to Raimundo Mata. Yay, Gina! Oh, Gina, I think you're still muted. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, <clears throat> thank you so much, uh, Eastwind. Thank you so much, MT. Thank you so much, all of you, for being here. Um, I do think that uh, what Eastwind Bookstore is doing in uplifting Asian voices, clearly it's very important in this country. After what we saw th this last week um, um, in the event at Atlanta. So um, I'm hugely grateful for um, organizers like this and readers like you and um, hosts like MT that um, help us to come together. 
I'm going to read from uh, the opening of the novel. So I'm just going to read two voices, the editor's preface and um, a section of Dr. Diwata Drake's um, comments. So a section of the editor's preface as well. So editor's preface. I had not read General Mata's journals when I spoke last year to a Murkian psychoanalyst about the possibility of hysterical abreactions occurring on a national scale. This was during a lull at a conference at a floating restaurant on Manila Bay, or was it a fish market in Kowloon? I, I can't keep those junkets straight. There was a full moon and we could see the marble columns of a colonial building nearby a monstrous wreck that gave the shanty town around it a nasty glamour. The scholar was an unshaved blonde, the kind one often meets at academic conferences. She was expounding on independence movements as, quote, macroscopic examples of aggressivity in the analysis while she fondled some frangipani and picked through the pectorals of a peeking duck. It struck me as she manhandled vertebrae and munched on the fronds or vice versa that Academic blondes are aggressive bores. To compare our revolution, the crux of our history, to some hysterical patient on a hypothetical couch was just icing on her slanderous cake. But what did I have to offer her as evidence of the irreducible reality of our history? I knew no scholar, no text, not even a comic book that spoke of the Philippine War of Independence without disturbing solipsism or deeply divided angst. It's a history that invites neurotics to speak up. It's no great surprise that it ends up a vulgar patient in obscure neo-Freudian journals. Addendum. Dr. Diwata Drake's inspiring defense. First of all, I'm not blonde. Yes, I read and read the Finnish Peruvian philosopher retired to the jeweled coast of Provence, Claro Murk, guilty. I would wish that crime on my enemies. However, more pertinently, I am an American of mixed heritage, a Midwestern mongrel, but I'm Filipino on my mother's side. Okay, half Filipino on my maternal grandmother's side, but the Viking ancestors in my father's Milwaukee line might add Eskimo. So there. Blondness is only a pharmaceutical indulgence in my family. In other words, and I never confessed this to anyone but my first love, who then promptly abandoned me. I'm a bottle blonde, Clairol spun gold, number 34. That I have a nervous disposition, I will allow. As Mork says, and I paraphrase, to each yama, his own symptom. My papers on the psychoanalysis of the Filipino independence movement are no accident, as my own analyst has betrayed to me. The seed was my experience in the Wisconsin public schools. I wanted so much to be part of their group, the dairy damaged Cretans who pulled at my brunette braids and once hung me from the gym rafters in a rug while singing the theme song from Fiddler on the Roof. I'm not Jewish, I kept saying, but I was in a rug and they couldn't hear me. My interest in the Philippines was inevitable. The country has a history of self-loathing that may not be necessarily unfounded. The end, I'll end there. Thank you so much for reading. It's always a pleasure to hear the author read directly from their text and to have these words come alive through voice. So thank you so much for that wonderful reading, Gina. So I'm gonna go ahead and start our conversation. Again, everyone, please feel free to um, post questions on the chat box and react to our comments. And um, I will, um, and then later, after our conversation, um, we will be opening it up to Q&A for the audience. So um, based on um, what was read with these, um, with these excerpts from the beginning of the book, um, I wanted to actually draw our attention to the preface of the revolution according to Raimundo Mata that was, um, you know, that that Gina provided um, as the author's note on the American edition. So in this author's note, you write on page three, Filipinos embody a definition of the human, a translated being. We are always only, only on the cusp of being understood 
or understanding ourselves. So can you share more about what it means for Filipinos to be a translated being? Um, later on in the author's note, you also mentioned that Filipino identity is incomplete and indeterminate. Um, what does this incompleteness and indeterminacy, how does that relate to Filipinos being a translated uh, being? And how can this um, ambivalence lead to um, complex and revolutionary constructions of identity and selfhood? Thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, yeah, so what I was doing in the author's preface really is there's a it's a it's a particular, I guess, hobby horse of mine, this um, notion that because of the way Filipinos exist, which is, in my experience, um, that there's so many different ways that, that we have so many languages, we, we learn in English, um, we, we hear the news in Tagalog, um, in the morning you might wake up to the radio in my in my in my town in Waray. So there's so language in itself creates multiple ways of being for the Filipino, and my contention has always been that this may, makes us not not alien, not necessarily alien, but actually hyperhuman. It's a it, I, in my view, all human beings are translated that from the very beginning as babies when we. Um, in order to speak our desire, in, our, in order to speak and, to, and be seen. Um, the use of language has always been, in my view, um, well, it's not my view, it's actually Lacanian, it's Lacanian psychoanalysis. Um, we are othered by language. Um, what I feel about the Filipino experience is that it is hyper, you know, human in the sense that it is so um, obvious, it is so daily, it is so ingrained in ourselves to be constantly recognizing, here's one way of looking at it, here's another way of looking at it, because of the multiple ways um, we, we exist because of colonization. And also because we're archipelagic. And the way I think about incompleteness and the way I think about um, translatedness is that it is not a deficit, it is an opportunity. So, um, what it allows us to do is recognize our contingency and therefore our ways of radicalizing the world, or of, of creating change and transformation, uh, because we're not always the same person, you know. Um, and so that's just one way of looking at it. There are many other ways, but I, I'll, I'll end there. Thank you so much. Like I, that's such a wonderful way to think about Filipino identity and Filipino selfhood as hyperhuman and multiple and archipelagic. I always mispronounce that word, but yeah, it makes sense because the Philippines is an island of seven thousand, sometimes seven thousand to twelve, depending on the tide. So of course, we are um, multiple beings. So. Um, my next question is about um, the writing process for the book, in particular, um, the structure. So how did you decide to place um, Mimi C, Estrella Espejo, and Dr. Diwata Drake in the footnotes? Um, the footnotes are so engaging. And while reading the footnotes, I felt like I, I personally felt like I was sitting down and having tea with like these titas with my aunties and just listening to, listening to them argue about, um, you know, Filipino history and Filipino and Philippine literature. So I'm really interested in how um, you decided to place um, Mimi C, Estrella Espejo, and Dr. Diwata Drake in the footnotes. and. Um, was it difficult to flesh them out as three-dimensional characters? And um, how do these footnotes reveal how um, power, hierarchy, and dominance is embedded in Philippine history? Yeah, yeah, those are great questions. I mean, all there, and they are all linked, um, the process and the issue and the questions of dominance and all of these other ways of reading the history that I think is um, really part of, I mean, I guess the daily, the way I understand things. So one is um, when you're writing a novel, um, this is just this is just me. Uh, when I write a novel, I write a novel out of pleasure. You know, I write a novel because I enjoy it. And so I seek that structure and I seek those voices that give me pleasure. So originally, so, so I do a lot of different things when I'm writing. Um, 
I know how it's going to end. Um, for this one, I actually knew it was going to end with Makamisa. I didn't know how it was going to end with Makamisa. Um, and I and I play with point of view. So there are two things that a novelist works with, point of view and time. And uh, point of view, once you get point of view right, that's good. Uh, so originally this novel did not get point of view right because Mimi, Mimi, and Mimi in particular was in the, there, was, there were no footnotes. It was Mimi talking about returning home. And uh, so you, you notice that that kind of thing, that happened in Insurrect. So Mimi is actually returning home in Insurrecto. But um, in this novel, it was, which was way earlier than Insurrecto, Mimi was returning home, there was a problem. She, in order to get her mind off of things, she was going to be reading this history, this, these journals that her editor wanted her to work on. But what I found was, um, and there was going to be no journal, there was only going to be this kind of tracing of different ways of reading the journal and the whole novel was just gonna be that. But what I found was I needed the journal. Um, and so, and then I didn't want an overwhelming single voice. So the journal had Raimundo Mata's voice, but then the footnotes allowed me to interweave ways of thinking instead of having a singular voice on the nation um, of, you know, of one person. So, and that was a lot more fun. I mean, Estrella Espejo's voice for me was a lot of fun. Um, Dr. Diwata Drake, that she came from my readings of Lacan, to be honest, and I just, I just completely fucked over Lacan. But you know, just completely messing up those things. Um, a lot of it was messing up, disruption of things that I read. Um, so a lot of the process is disruption and messing up and being very, very happy with your ability to disrupt and, um, and just, Australia will say one thing, uh, uh, Diwata will respond and go blah, 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 that, that sucks. A translator will, will have a synthesis. Someone can respond to the translator and so it's just a lot of fun of argument that I think is very much part of Philippine history. Philippine history is hugely contested because of course we had to make our history. As part of nation making under, a col under colonization. Yeah, thank you so much for that. The Philippines definitely has a contested history. And to follow up on what you said about, um, you know, having multiple voices and not providing a single view of what nationhood means or what the Philippines looks like as a nation. Also, sorry, very loud motorcycle <laughs> outside my house in the background. Um, I was wondering if you could speak more about that and particularly the relationship between um, nationhood, literature, fantasy, and the novel. So um, as you have illuminated in the book, um, the Philippines as a nation was born, like emerged from a novel, um, Jose Rizal's No Le Mitangre, um, Touch Me Not. Um, can you further elaborate on the role of fiction and fantasy um, in the formation of a nation? Um, how does, um, you know, these contested ideas of Philippine history and nationhood, um, what role does that play in the formation of a translated or incomplete uh, Filipino identity? And um, do you feel that um, striving for nationhood is an accurate structure for um, the social political conditions of the Philippines? Yeah, um, so what's fascinating about the country for me as a novelist and as a citizen as well. Um, I'm a citizen of two nations. So um, what's fascinating for me about go going through the history of the Philippines is how, how we are grounded in revolutionary um, act. So it's a nation grounded in revolution. Um, it's a powerful thing to recognize about the ways Filipinos decided, the agency that Filipinos had to move against their oppressor. The first um, uh, uh, revolution, revolutionary wars in Asia and very early anti-colonial 
um, writing um, um, in, in Asia and in the world. So, um, so that's really amazing to me. And the fact that it comes from a lot of our co concepts of ourselves come from a novel as a novelist, that's like crazy for me. And of course it's huge, it's a huge burden on the Filipino novelists to have Rizal on our backs. That's, that's always been the case. Um, how do we get out of the shadow of Rizal? In my view, we don't need to. We need to embrace it. We need to, we, I mean, I think we're particularly lucky to have Rizal on our backs. Um, and so that fictive quality of nation, because we arise from texts, is combined with a historical agency that we actually had to move out of um, our, uh, our, um, our oppressors. And, and so they collide, you know, action and text. Um, the the ways that that the ways they engender um, uh, analysis are are really powerful for a writer. Um, but uh, what what was your other part of that of your question, MT? When you were, I didn't write it down. What was, oh. what was the second part of that? Oh, oh like what the re relationship between um, nation is to mm -hmm. um, creating like this translated or incomplete Filipino identity. Yeah, we were all, we, and then so what happened to us was, so we're lucky in that we have resolved, you know, Eric Gamalinda, if you know the novelist, Eric Gamalinda, who's an amazing Filipino novelist and poet, to be honest, he's, a, he's just, he's even a more amazing poet. But what he said to me once, really Gina, what, what, what unites the Filipino? What really unites, we have 7,000 islands, we have 150 languages, what really unites the Filipino? And he said, Rizal and Chismis. <laughs> anyway, um, so, <clears throat> uh, so it is pretty profound that we can still trace ourselves to the Noli. Um, and it's an amazing gift for us. Uh, and, but to recognize that we are constantly nation making is also kind of fabulous. Um, some people want to be sad about it. I, I, don't, I don't buy into a sadness about incompleteness because humans are incomplete. We aren't, we're, we're created by others, we're constructed by others. We were already created as babies by the misnaming of ourselves by our mothers. We are named by our, for our mother's desires. We're not, we didn't name ourselves. So we are constructed by others. That's just, hum, that's, that's just being human. The incompleteness of the Filipino um, is for me a, to acknowledge it, to recognize it, to, be const to have it constantly in your face is for me a strength for, for us as, as, as people because we're always recognizing our ability to change and to move. Um, look at what we have right now in the Philippines. We have a very dire government, horrific government. In some ways, some people chose that guy for their concept of change, okay? So that was not so great because it was a bad concept of change because it meant killing people. At the same time, as people are being killed, there are people in the country who are still really going after this president, many of them women. So we have a strong history of resistance that um, to be honest, we should be very proud of. So the nation making that we're, that, you know, there's, there's a lot of contested history because of course we were colonized and we have to keep thinking about the power that produced us also that's producing and interrupting and negating who we are. And so um, uh, we, we constantly have to analyze how we were made as a nation because the text that, that made us, for instance, even the way Rizal has been moved in many different ways under the American regime, under the Filipinos, the, bour the bour bourgeois Filipinos of the Commonwealth, the class issues that remain in the Philippines, really horrible classism in the country. Um, and, uh, you know, so that we constantly have to analyze us in terms of nation making um, and, and analyze power. Um, and that's true of America, that's true of France, that's true of Tunisia, that's true of Latin America, it's, it's true everywhere. But 
for us, it's in our case as heirs of resolve. Yes, thank you so much for um, explain for that wonderful comment and like yeah I'm, I've been thinking about what Rizal means to me as someone who like I I was born in the United States but um, I actually lived in the Philippines when I was a child up until age five so I'm actually fluent in Tagalog and um, I my family has regularly visited the Philippines throughout my entire life so in many ways I do consider the Philippines as like my home you know as my homeland so um, when I'm, I'm also really interested in how um, you know the relationship is between like anglophone Philippine literature and Filipino American literature and how um, Filipinos being in the shadow of Rizal and kind of inheriting or contending with this colonial history and also um, with these like with anti-imperialist struggle is kind of serves as this bridge between both of those worlds between those bodies of work between like the Philippine Anglophone and the Filipino American lit so I was just wondering um, what your point of view is on the, you know the similarities and differences between those bodies of work and um, what shared um, traditions that they have. I'm just going to start with the fact that you know so the novel is really uh, reflecting on Rizal, thinking about the reading of Rizal and multiple ways of reading Rizal um, in the country and to recognize that we don't read in general we don't read Rizal in the original in Spanish. So um, we have had to, so there's an interesting aspect of our um, reading of Rizal that is part of our imagination. So it is an imagined, highly imagined Rizal at the same time that, that there is the text. And I, I will say that reading the English text is, is fine. You know, you don't have to read the Spanish text. Um, and, so language has always been an interesting kind of aspect of the hybridity, aspect of that multiplicity of the Filipino. At the same time that that has never been, um, in my view, language has also never been ultimately a barrier, it's certainly been a challenge, but it's never been a barrier to the mutuality that few Filipinos feel for each other, whether or not the mutuality of Filipinos in the different provinces, which all have our different languages. You know, in my province, the South is Cebuano, the North is Waray. So in my province, in one, in one island alone, you have two different languages that, and, and you, you're not gonna say that the Letenia, who is Cebuano, I'm Waray, the Letenia Subuano is not Letenia. Everyone understands our commonality. Everyone understands our mutuality. And so the Filipino and the Filipino American um, literatures, um, the Filipino Anglophone lit literatures versus the Filipino literatures in the different languages um, only tell us that the power of in a way, our ways of nation making, oh, what I power, yes. Uh, the power of, our, of the ways of our nation making, which has had to contend with this multiplicity all the time. And it's not like it's peaceful, <laughs> peaceful multiplicity, you know, even just the ways that different regions will be, you know, joking about each, about each other. That's kind of funny. Um, but, um, but it is something for us to think about that the mutuality is there. And I, again, the divisions that seem to occur between Filipino, Filipino in the Philippines, um, Filipino American, um, there are differences because if you grow up in America as a, as a, if you're a Filipino, if you have Filipino family and you grow up in America um, and you're American, um, your experience of your color, your experience of your culture, your, your family's culture is very different. And I would say, you know, 
Filipinos should have huge empathy for the Filipino American. I just think that there's a lack of understanding of sometimes in the Philippines of the horrors of the racism that um, Filipinos here in America grow up with. At the same time, um, it is correct for Filipinos to, to say, you know, I want you to say my words correctly. You know, it is correct for a Filipino to say, um, there's something that the Filipino American doesn't understand about growing up in the Philippines. The ex exoticizing the country is not that great for Filipinos. Um, and that's not, I'm not saying that that's what, that's, these are just words that Filipinos might use about Phil Am or, 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 what, or um, just different uh, conversations that you might have. But I do think ultimately um, when Filipinos get together, I think there is, it's just the way the nation has been brought up. Um, a sense of mutual regard for each other. Uh, one-on-one -on -one is, I think, always there. Um, issues of power should always be analyzed in any, for me, this is what I do every day. I analyze issues of power when, whoever I'm meeting, wherever I go. And certainly with the Filipino versus Phil, um, relationships, you should always be recognizing. And there are different ways in which power would be constructed in those, in those issues, you know when a Filipino and a Filipino-American talk about um, their Filipinoness. Thank you so much. That gives me so much to think about in regards to the relationship between Filipinos in the Philippines and, um, you know, Phil Ams in the United States. And in relation to that, um, I was, while reading this book, I was also thinking a lot about um, diaspora and how the character of Raimundo Mata himself and also Rizal himself are um, representative of diaspora and how the Filipino is constantly like, um, you know, pushed and pulled under the constructions of diaspora. So I was wondering if you could speak more about um, about your views about diaspora and how you no, the decision around locating both Mata and Rizal as these sort of, you know, diasporic beings, even though they're located in the Philippines. Yeah, so I'll, I'll just go back to what I had just said about accents and, you know, how people speak, um, uh, where a Filipino will say, yeah, that's not the way, I mean, I, you know, having, I was a little, I was a little girl in America for a very short time, and then I went home to the Philippines and, um, I realized I didn't I didn't understand my language anymore. I was a baby when I left. I was young when I left, and then I came back, and I was only like first grade or second grade. I forget. Um, and I didn't I didn't understand what I anymore. And people really hate you if you don't know the language and you look Filipino. I mean that's just the way people are. And it's like I'm you know as a child I'm going what the fuck you know you're stupid. I of course I don't know your language because I wasn't here for a long time you know. So you do those things. Um, so the way I've, I'm always understanding uh, um, these incidents is that um, you, there's always going, like, okay, I'm also a novelist. So this is also the way I understand things. I also, I, I always take in how the other person is responding. I step back and I, not as a child, of course, as a child, I'm very annoying, but as a grown up, you know, I always step back and go, okay, this is the reason why that person is thinking like that. You know, this Filipino Warai who's annoyed with me because it, I, I'm seemingly pretending not to speak Warai when, you know, when I, you know, whatever it is. Um, uh, and understanding where they're coming from and the centrality of their space and just understanding the centrality of that space of that particular person. It's what I have to do as a novelist, to be honest. It might be why I became a novelist because that's what I was always doing. That, oh, that's how, what, that's why she was mad at me. Oh, that's why I'm mad at her, blah, blah, blah. So recognizing that each person has a centrality in their own world, every person is central to their own world. And in the diaspora, I think one of the things that gets erased or gets 
um, not seen very well in majority white cultures, in majority Western cultures, and then the Filipino is in that dias diasporic world, um, is that one, I'm going to be honest, I think Filipinos still have a strong sense of the centrality of their position. They might not be saying it out loud to the white person that's, that's with them, you know, um, but the centrality of being Filipino is there. Um, I, I just think about my mom or my aunt who said she went to, she's been living in, my, my aunt living in Los Angeles forever, um, goes to, first time she goes to the Getty Museum, I take her there because I said, there's the Getty right there near you, let, let me go. Let's go, first time she goes. And so it's, um, it's Da Vinci, because we're looking at some of these drawings of Da Vinci. And she goes, oh, look, she says to her um, son, Didon, look, Didon, he writes, this guy writes with his left hand, just like you. He does this mirror stuff, just like you did when you were a baby. So Da Vinci and her child, the centrality of her world, Da Vinci is nothing next to her child. The world is her and her child. Um, there's something about that, some will call that provincial. I will say that um, it's emblematic of a lot of the people that I grew up with. <laughs> I don't know. They thought that they were the heroes of the world all the time. Um, you know, they were, it's not that no man is an island. We are the island and we are the, the um, top of the heap of the island. Um, so Rizal was very interesting to me in that he was of a diasporic world. If you think about it in Europe, he was always also always the center. He centered the Filipino constantly. And so he worked like a very, very early Orientalism guy, you know, um, who was the guy, Edward Said. He's like a very early Edward Said. He's, there's the Western world here. He's centering the Filipino world constantly. You see that in all his letters, his, you see that in everything. I mean, he did this whole Morga, which is all footnotes. So, so the Morga history of the Philippines, and he just footnotes all of these other ways of looking at the Philippines against um, Morga's, um, Morga's stuff. So um, that is, you know, I think it, it's healthy for us um, in the diasporic world to recognize that we do have this figure, Rizal, who centered the Philippines, his Filipinoness always. He was in a, apparently, the, one of his letters, he's just joking with someone. Oh, I was in this museum uh, in, in Japan and I pretended to be Japanese in front of these British people. So he, he, he didn't know Japanese, he just pretended to speak Japanese and started speaking Japanese to these, to these British people. Anyway, so that's just, you know, um, uh, always centering who you are um, is kind of interesting. Thank you so much, Gina. Yeah, I remember reading that that story of Rizal pretending to be Japanese in the book, and I laughed so hard. And I was like, "Is this real? Is this true? Did he really?" You know do what? That? Most of the shit in that book is true. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, like the pearl divers who were who were diving in Australia, they were from Capis. That's true. I and who knows? Who knows if the revolutionaries were lying or making up stories? But these are stories that I got from revolution from revolutionary memoirs. Mm -hmm. Yes, I also did not know that he was only four feet eleven inches, and as yes. someone who is only four ten, that made me so happy I was like wow I'm only an inch shorter than Rizal like I feel so validated if you go through the Ayala Museum they have a the Ayala Museum has this exhibit on Rizal that that just measures him and says yeah he's 4'11 <laughs> yeah and my mom knew that my whole life and she never told me until I was reading this book and I also like shared like the names like oh mom did, did you learn about this person and that person she's like yeah yeah and I was like why didn't you ever share this history with me well I was again uh, you know the centrality of the Filipino stuff I don't have to tell you shit you know yeah you go and learn your own shit I know my shit you you go and learn yours so, <laughs> thank you so much so we are now transitioning to the Q&A thank you so much Gina for answering all of my questions and for starting off starting us off with this conversation. And um, now we have the opportunity to engage with our wider audience. So um, 
folks, please feel free to raise your hands and also um, just type up any questions in the chat box. I'm brief. I'm just gonna scroll up really quickly and see if there if we already have some questions. So let me just check the chat box really quickly. Okay, so, oh, somebody has their hand raised. April, please go ahead. Hi, um, thank you. I, I enjoyed the book. You know, it took me a little while to get into the reading cadence because of all the footnote interruptions, but then I came to really appreciate those, um, the dialogue between those characters um, as footnotes. Um, so thank you for that. I was curious um, for Dr. Diwata, like, she would list different locations throughout the book. What was the what was um, the importance or significance of that? Uh, I don't know. I um, Diwata was, you know, I guess. I mean, what comes to mind? I I'm going to be honest. When I made different things, I really didn't have um, too many. Um, ideas about them. But if I were asked about it, you know, immediately what comes to mind is this location. Um, and that she, there are two things there about this location. One, that um, she is this, yes, she's definitely a diaspora person. Um, and, and her ways of thinking about identity in which identity is null for Dr. Diwata. Identity is um, something that we construct, but it is empty. Um, and we use language, use all of these different kinds of things. And what she's doing is she's constantly deconstructing a concept of identity, which to be honest, I'm also always doing. I do all of these different things that all of these people are doing all the time in my novel. Um, and so I just put, put in there all the tessellations of the ways I view identity or nation or self or Filipino. Um, Cause I do think Filipino is a very full concept. It's also an empty concept in that everyone else is a, is, has their you know, Frenchness, their, you know, all of that stuff. So her, I think her various places are, a matter of the being everywhere and nowhere at, in terms of identity. Um, and, and again, as in terms of the Phil Am and the Filipino, because she, she's clearly the one, so she grew up in the state, she has like some Filipino-ness to her, um, but this, uh, an interesting apposition, not opposition, but apposition, to the Filipino um, nationalist in that she is that Filipino who's always wandering around. Of course, she has privilege, she's a scholar, um, but she's always wandering around. Um, whereas the Filipino um, Australia notice she's stuck in place in a sanatorium. And so I thought, so th there's something going on there about, I. I for me, it would be up to the reader to really figure it out, but it immediately comes to mind that it, I never thought about this as I was writing it, by the way. I'm just, I'm just saying this now because you asked the question. Um, she's stuck in a bed, Estrella. The other one is going all around. Both of them are Filipino. Thank you. So we have a question from Perlita. Perlita, please go ahead and unmute yourself. Yeah, hi, thank you, MT. Um, hello, Gina. Um, it's hello. a pleasure to meet you. Yeah. I wasn't sure I would I would come today, but I'm so glad I um I attended. I like that you're drinking wine while I yeah. do this author's <laughs> talk. I, I really I'm really enjoying it. Um, mm -hmm. I um I said Warai Power because I, it's not often that I meet people who speak Warai. Um, I grew up in the south, uh, eastern somewhere actually. That's where my oh. family's from. If you know where that is. Near Balangi. Uh, eight hours from uh, Tacloban, that famous mm -hmm. city. Um, and uh, I was sitting here listening to you and thinking about Duterte's government and um, all that's gone on over there. And uh, um, I like your discussion about translation and, and revolutions and, and thinking of myself as a Filipino American um, and uh, the many languages I had to learn. Um, so I, I spoke what I as a child and then um, uh, ended up living in along with those cities. So I learned Tagalog. And then I came to the United States, and before I came to the United States, I was learning English. Um, so all these languages, um, 
And uh, here in the United States, you know, I've taken out Spanish uh, and uh, Indonesian and other languages. So it's like, um, I, I never thought of it as a unique experience. I always thought it was something that I had to do, but maybe with regards to what you just said about Filipinos and translation and our lives and translation, then maybe it's something that, that is a very Filipino thing. Um, uh, and then thinking about revolutions, um, uh, in 1986, I was a child when uh, the People's Power uh, Revolution happened. And I remember how powerful that was. Um, and then uh, with the Duterte government, that's also a kind of revolution, right? It's just no, not in the same, I don't think that same Duterte vein. <laughs> I know, I do not think the Duterte government is a revolution. I think a revolution would be something that is truly transformative in, sense, in, in the sense of justice, in the sense of thinking about the natural rights, the rights of citizens. The reason why it cannot be, we cannot say that the Duterte, the Duterte government is a revolution is that he is not at all considering the rights of people. I mean, I will say this, it, it bothers me very much to um, consider him in line with the revolutionaries that we're talking about. Um, for one thing, Duterte, sorry, sorry, Perlita, I'm just gonna go on about this because I think this is, this is important. Oh no, please, please um, go on. For one thing, um, Duterte has used our revolutionary history for the violence that he is, he is actually doing to Filipinos. So um, in my last novel in Insurrecto, this is definitely something that I did because I wanted people to see in that novel. And I think it's true, even if you think about Raimundo Mata, that structurally there's something very similar to um, Americans, to, okay, the, the Spaniards going after the Katiponeros in 1896 and then in 1898. Um, the Americans going after the so-called insurrectos in 1899 through 1913 or so. And Marcos era going after, he called them communists in those 20 years of his rule. And this year, and, and during Duterte, the same, you're, you're gonna see the same pictures of uh, victims, of uh, violated Filipinos. In the case of Duterte, early on, it was so-called drug addicts. L right now, he's going after peasant leaders, labor leaders, uh, student activists. Um, he is killing Lumad leaders. And, um, and you'll see the same pictures. So, Catiponero, insurrecto, communist, activists. Drug addicts were very interesting. I think drug addicts were the grooming. It's, it's Duterte grooming the Filipinos for the violence that he was going to do against, against um, re revolutionary forces. So um, uh, I think there has to be a clear distinction between what we call revolution and um, <laughs> state terror. Duterte is doing state terror. I agree. I appreciate yes, that I'm analysis. Sorry, yeah, so, so what was your question? Oh, no, I don't have a question. I just wanted to rattle off for a couple of minutes yeah. and then listen to you. <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah, no, thank you very much. And you know, again, um, you're, you're from Eastern Samar. Uh, insurrecto, maran ka magbaray? Konti. Konti lang. Okay. So, um, uh, Insurrecto, all of my novels are full of barai. Um, Insurrecto is actually set, uh, the, the battle that I talk about in Insurrecto is, is set in Eastern Samar. It's in um, the towns of Balangiga, San Roque, Giwan, Hiporlos, those, those towns along the coast um, in, in Samar. It's a revolutionary uh, ge geography, Eastern Samar. It's a, mm -hmm. it's a historic, geography of Filipinos who under extreme violence of the Americans rose up against them. And we should be very proud of that history of Eastern Samar. Yes, and Giwan is very familiar to me. That was the, the Giwan, big town yeah. nearby. 
they it, they very early on 1901 they um they went after the americans that's awesome they um, and then just the uh, present present day you know the um uh, in terms of climate change that area is always yes. hit by like the worst and those climate change uh, activists typhoons those climate change activists in Samar and Leyte, they are in prison right now, in prison by Duterte. Wow. I'm so angry. Salamat po. Thank you. Thank you, Gina and Perlita. Um, we have time for one more question and Jonathan um, has his hand up. So please go ahead and unmute yourself, Jonathan. Hi, Gina. Thank you so much for the incredible book. Um, I was thinking about how you wrote as a novelist that you've been having the role of understanding others and how they think and how they have their own kind of central um, way of thinking. I'm, I, I was almost every time you said like the role of the novice, the role of yourself, I've been substituting in the word there revolutionary, that the role of the revolutionary is to kind of analyze power also. And also the storytelling is to show others. And as you just said earlier, like, these patterns across generations of how there is oppression and how there could possibly is to fight back. And um, when you were talking um, to MT about, about um, the, the mother-daughter relationship of um, I learned all this and it's on your own to learn this too, I was wondering about how you're stepping in the shoes of Rizal and you, as a non-Filipino person, you mentioned that it's a big shoes to possibly fill that shouldn't be a burden, but is. I was thinking about how you are stepping into the role of, kind of teaching um, revolution or teaching the stories so that um, others can be stepping up or can be stepping into understanding history a bit more and how you've kind of have stepped into that with um, this book or what you think about um, how a novelist tells stories about what are the patterns of power to bring to light, to inspire hearts and to bring people to be better revolutionaries themselves or to take up um, their fights. Thank you so much. And um, surely um, the Filipinos uh, have Rizal has surely aggrandized the role of the novelist in freeing people and freeing a nation, creating a nation, and in, um, in, in producing revolution. Because he literally, I mean, the novel literally did that. That's kind of weird, isn't it? Um, so, but I would say um, as a writer, uh, knowing very well what so many people are doing in the Philippines who are actually on the ground doing the actions that endanger them and uh, that we should be honoring and figuring out how to help. The role of the novelist, um, the, my, my own work as a novelist is is very small, <laughs> is very small. And I, I couldn't move myself into the space of Rizal simply because um, of the historical condition that occurred then with Rizal where his novel was definitely used. It was a strategy used by Bonifacio and the Katipunan to get people um, involved in their, um, their organization. Um, but what Rizal, okay, let me just go to what I think Rizal might have been doing. Rizal wanted to be a writer. He happened to be a writer at a time when to be a writer for him meant that he needed to speak about, to center the Filipino world, therefore a world of oppression. And in doing that, he moved the nation. Um, he was also highly polemical, as all writers should be. I think writers should be polemical. I think you should have a clear uh, understanding of, of why you're doing this thing in terms of others, in terms of the world that's around you. Um, but the world, my work, of, my work from the very beginning is really to write a book. <laughs> so um, I think. I think we shouldn't confuse a work of art for revolution. I think it will not produce revolution if we confuse um, acts of reading or acts of writing for, for truly doing the work of um, that so many people on the ground in the Philippines are doing right now. Um, it would be a huge disservice to them. 
but I think it behooves writers. I think it is imperative for writers to think about truth in terms of the society that we live in and deal with those difficult truths of power that, uh, that allow others to see and maybe move in a different direction from the white worlding that we have here in America, the unconscious white supremacist world of many ordinary Americans, many good people, but they have white supremacist worlds in them and writing these novels that maybe allow them to see the history of this white worlding, this white supremacy, this, this, um, this racial uh, injustice, these um, economic injustices that are produced and it are interlocked with um, race and um, economic power. Um, writing those pieces, being very aware, might help others, but there are people who are actively working and dying for our freedoms. Thank you so much, Gina. Um, Thank you so, for the questions, for all of your questions, April, Jonathan, and Perlita. Okay, so I know I said that was the last question, but um, the East Wind Book Club and I myself are also interested in, really quickly, um, what was the message in the translator's postcard? Yeah. At the end? <laughs> yeah. I'll tell you one thing about it. So I was reading results miscellaneous, it's something called miscellaneous writings. I, it's, I, I think I've read almost all of Rizal that's translated into English. So um, there's a book called Miscellaneous Writings and Rizal is just writing chismis about his friends, but he writes chismis about his friends, go so gossip. So he does gossip about his friends in code. And so that phrase is directly from Rizal. Uh, uh, Miente bastante no puede confiar en él. So his code was noamla berlemla, something, 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 I forget exactly what it was. So Noamla Berlenda. So um, she turns it around. Um, uh, the translator, Mimi, turns it around. So, so instead of saying um, miente bastante, which is he's lying, um, she says, no miente. Se, se puede confiar en él. So she turns it around. She's not lying. You can trust her. Whoa. Okay, <laughs> that's mind blowing. That completely changes my viewpoint of Mimi C. I'm probably gonna go back and look well, at Well, <laughs> well remember, Mimi C is centering her world. Yeah. She's centering her world. So you can see all the different ways that um, that Diwata and Australia might go after her. Yeah. Thank you so much, Gina. So thank you everyone for, you know, being here, for bearing witness to our conversation and for asking such wonderful, beautiful, scintillating questions. Um, before we end, um, could I say thank you to the, um, to the questioners who brought in their own selves to this, you're centering yourself. So thank you. Yeah. So before we end, um, we do have uh, an announcement from Eastwind Books. So uh, please turn to back to uh, Kat. Yeah, so thank you so much, Gina. And finally, we get to know. <laughs> and thank you, MT, for hosting. So for all of you who have come today, you are the first to hear that East Winds is offering actually a 20% off in the revolution, according to Raimundo Mata. So I posted it in the chat. So if you're interested, take advantage of the sale while it's still happening. Yay. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank you all, everyone, for joining us. Um, have a wonderful day. Have a great weekend. Thank you so much, Gina, for mm -hmm. being with us today. I want to thank Eastwind Books for having me as your host. Um, even though I don't work at Eastwind before, Eastwind forever, <laughs> I will always work rep Eastwind hard no matter where, where I am. And I will also rep Filipino literature hard no matter where I am too. So thank you everyone for being here and have a wonderful day. Oh, oh this conversation was recorded and it will be posted later um, if you wanna share it and view it, uh, view our conversation again. So thanks everyone. Oh thank wait, before so we much. go, can oh. we take a photo? Oh yes, picture. Yeah. <laughs> okay, okay. I'm gonna, um,
Okay, get yourselves ready. Um, if you have the book, pull it up. If you don't have the book, we can Photoshop it in. Um, okay, and let me, I can take this picture just a second. I don't think I can do that holding the book and take the picture. Um, okay, okay. Ready, one, two, three. Another one, one, two, three. And one more, one, two, three. Great. So thank you all so much. Thank you. Bye, Bye everyone. Thank Take care. Gina, thank you, MT. Thank you, everyone. Hi, Harvey. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, Harvey Duck, we didn't get you in the picture. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh Harvey, Harvey. <laughs> you got to just make sure. He just okay, snuck up yeah. there. <laughs> okay. Hi, Harvey. <laughs> so good to see you. I have to go.